Hello, world singers. My name is Brooke. And I'm Tyler. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. Today we have a much sought after episode. Many people have referenced what we are talking about today, and we're finally here. Looking at all of the different world hoppers that appeared in Rhythm of War, we're just going to go through and give a brief like take on just hot takes. Boom, boom, <laughs> boom. What's this? And we are just going to hit all of the little world hoppers because there are so many in Rhythm of War. It definitely is the book, and we have mentioned this before, the book that we will look back on and be like, oh, that's when everything really started to take off. Yeah. It certainly seems like the point in which everything is really beginning to come together in an overt way. And we see so many of these different people, some which have larger roles, but most which have pretty small roles, even in their main stories, Yeah, that are appearing on Rashar and have been appearing on Rashar throughout the books. But Rhythm of War took that to another level. And we started to see more directly because of characters like Marais and Thydekar, the different types of investiture throughout the Cosmere also appearing on Rashar. So we're going to take a look at all of that stuff. And because it is still the summertime here in the Northern Hemisphere, we ask that you rate us, review us, star us, thumbs up us on whatever social media podcast feed that you may have. <laughs> We've already noticed a definite uptick in reviews. And we thank you. Thank you so much. For those people who are still listening, you are just wonderful. Thank you so much. And please do it because last month was my birthday month, but this month that's Brooke's birthday month. And that's the more important one. So we need some (laughs) ratings for this month. Give me that love podcast listeners. (laughs) Okay, we're gonna start our exploration of world hoppers on Rashar with we're gonna start at the beginning with the first first of the sun that is wow, great play. I loved it. Thank you. There is, of course, one of the most obvious, uh, at least to Cosmere Aware people, most obvious world hoppers is, is the owner of an AVR that Lyft uh, comes across. She sees the AVR first and then finds the mysterious owner of the AVR, unfortunately dead, killed by Mraze. Yeah, and we have a description of that man and we don't have a name or anything like that he's just mysterious man with an avr quote it was an old and lethy man in robes he'd been killed with some kind of knife wound to the chest and lay his eyes open on the ground blood on his lips end quote now i think what becomes more important about this man is actually the, the avr and we know from first of the sun that the avr bestow a magical trait to their owner or the one that they have this bond with and travel with sometimes it can be like an area of effect type of thing where if you're within this realm but a lot of times it's specific to the individual that they are paired with not to get too ahead of ourselves but that avr is an important component because they are like players themselves yeah important to know that there are avr on Rashar. Now, every time I see a bird, I'm going to be like, is it an AVR? Yeah. Just like when we found out about Hordlings and Kremlings. And now every time we see a Kremling, we're like, is it one of the sleepless? Is he talking about a rock or is he talking about the sleepless? <laughs> or is he talking about rock? <laughs> so that'll be interesting. Do you think that Mraze's chicken is is an AVR as well. Oh, yes. My okay, assumption from the beginning was that Marais's hawkish seeming or like eagle, his had like an aggressive take yeah. to it. More than like what I it m- does more like, imagine is like parrots. It's attacking yeah, for sure. definitely. And so I imagine that is like the falcon, you know, falconeers with like their little <sighs> dudes who have the eye covers. That's kind of what I imagine. A very aggressive looking animal. And... I think that's terrifying because 
as I said, if Lyft has not bonded with an AVR and Marais has the AVR or he yeah. has his own AVR, I'm thinking that they're going to bestow some powers. It seems like Marais is a little bit like in a hoidish fashion, uh, accumulating all the different types of investiture from the Cosmere, as we see with his like glass chest of mysterious items. And now he has at least two AVR. So he's got some power, I think. Definitely very Hoyd-esque and possibly even, you know, inspired by Hoyd in the weird type of way of like passing on mm-hmm. the traits that Hoyd was doing some long time ago to someone else. And then it like moves through the <laughs> web of Cosmere where people that be like, oh, there's other powers and you should be interested. Why? Because we met this one guy like 300 years ago and he was interested in gaining the power from our region. And like a story got started about Hoyd. And then that story becomes important and motivation to Marais or other ghost bloods and other people. It could have, you know, had that circuitous route that all leads back to Hoyd. That's what all roads lead to Hoyd. (laughs) There is another interesting quote about the original owner of that AVR, though. Lyft, like, kind of sees him first, says that quote that you said, and then she sort of comes back to the body visually and is, like, taking another look to sort of be like, Hmm, who really is this person? And she actually asks Wendell if Wendell has ever seen this person before. And Wendell says, quote, a minor Alethi functionary, though his eyes are different now. Curious. Look at his fingers. Tan skin with bands of lighter skin. He was wearing jewelry once. Yes. Thinking about it, she thought she recognized him. One of the old people in the tower. Retired. Once an important official in the palace, she'd gone and talked to him because nobody paid attention to old people, end quote. I thought that was super interesting. The ring lines obviously make me think that he is also a Faroukamist. Definitely the only time we see rings heavenly implied is with Faroukami. This quote brings up a lot of different aspects about who is this person? How important are they? Clearly tied into maybe what Shalon's father was doing as well. Mm, I mean, they don't say that they see any kind of ghost bloods tattoo. So I feel like he's probably not a ghost bloods. He could be. uh, And we'll get to this. But there's a few different Farukamis that we see or like suspected Farukamis. And I think it's mentioned that there is one in the Alethi orbit, like keeping an eye on Dalinar. So it's heavily suspected that this might be that person. I just think as we're starting to see more and more, just like Mraes, we're starting to see world hoppers and people in general who are accumulating more than one type of investiture from more than one planet. And this is just one example of that. And then I think the other thing that's interesting is the comment that his eyes are different now. And I was wondering if that is maybe related to the eye drops that Shalon uses to darken her eyes, but maybe there's like a reverse where he can lighten his eyes. It would be interesting because the only other thing that we know of that makes your eyes turn light is a blade bond. Yeah, I think that's unlikely, though, because it wears off when you're not using it. Not using the blade, yeah. yeah. However, if his primary thing was trying to blend in something like the droplets would make a lot of sense to... But we haven't necessarily seen the reverse one when right. you can lighten someone's exactly. eyes. And it would definitely be frowned upon to like make and sell that yes. in <laughs> society. Other option, this is kind of a wild theory, but other option is that maybe he is a returned and is capable of changing his physical appearance in small ways or a light weaver maybe and can like put an illusion on his eyes. I don't know. I'm literally just spitballing. Once you start down the rabbit hole, (laughs) it actually does become very interesting how many different magic users across the Cosmere can manipulate their exterior form, a la the light weaving that we so 
CISO on display with Shallan, but that we also know is kind of related the Yolen based magic that Wit has and Hoyd himself is kind of a father of the light weavers or like, you know, <laughs> benefactor of the light weavers seems to really gel with the light weavers with all his hiding and disguising. But I think that there are many different options because there are so many world hoppers on Rashar. We're going to jump over to things that we think are from Scadriel next. Yeah, let's talk about the other Farukamas we've seen. There's one that's super obvious, but before we like really dive into that, I want to bring up a smaller potential Farukami sighting, which is in the prologue. Um, there is really just one sentence that, again, just made me think, is this person a Farukamist? But I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this theory. So let me know what you think. Yes. Here's the quote. Quote, out the door, Navani spotted the house steward, a white bearded man with too many rings on his fingers. End quote. And that's literally the only thing that's said about him. He's the house steward, so they have quite a bit of contact with him. Like, he's probably been at the palace for quite a while. So that's kind of the argument against it. I'm like, eh, would he really be in this type of position if he was a world hopper? But like I said, every time someone talks about a lot of rings on the fingers, I just automatically think they're from Scadriel. Because Brandon is, yes, trying to hide in plain sight these different crossovers. He's not dwelling on it or he's not giving a lot of attention and detail to it. They're often throwaway lines like this one, but he also is trying to give the hints. And so he uses language that is the same on purpose when he is trying to indicate, pay attention to this, even though it's a single line, I'm saying he has too many rings on his fingers yeah. <laughs> or he has a scar on his left cheek. <laughs> and all of these indicators that he repeats over and over again seem to be his way of cluing in readers without spending a lot of time on something. It's the shorthand that he seems to have developed. But there's actually a follow-up theory to this, which I want to introduce now Ooh, because okay. it is, I was going to save it for later, but let's just <sighs> roll right into it. Because if this is a Farukamist, the clear guess would be that Farukamists are from Scadriel. Mm -hmm. However, Old Tuck 72 on the 17 Shard forums was asked a question after they posited that perhaps this Farukamist is not from Scandriel. Mm. I want you to play the yes. I want you to play the skeptic. The skeptic? Yes. Okay. So you <laughs> ask the question and then I will narrate Old Tuck 72's response. Okay. Why wouldn't Farukamist be from Scandriel? I understand the point about which shard would take in refugees, but why do we need to assume that the terrorists went bouncing around planets and not just assume that they came to Rishar from the planet they already lived on? Prefacing Ultux 72's response with this fact, they had speculated that this terrorist was from Mercy's planet, where Mercy maybe acted as like a home of the refugees of the Cosmere, everyone flowing to Mercy. Okay. If I mean, they were a sure. refugee. Okay. Now, this is why the speculation. Quote, there are a couple of indicators. None of them definitely proves anything, but together they are suspicious. In Rhythm of War, it's strongly suggested that neither of the terrorist people in question was a ghost split. You have to ask yourself, how do you recruit terrorist people from Scadrill without Harmony or Thydekar knowing about it? The terrorist people of Scadrill were pacifist kind of hippies to an extreme degree at the time of Rhythm of War. We have a depiction with multiple rings, and multiple rings suggest a full Farukamist, which there aren't a lot of. It is the whole point of Scadrian history that the terrorist people were tried to be completely extincted and their line controlled for the Lord Ruler's purposes. However, on planet, one of the Farukamists is good enough with connection to pick up a language from another species years before the time of the Way of Kings and years before the Bands of Mourning, the more exotic forms of Farukami were still 
barely understood on Scadrial, and things like Duralumum must have been worth a fortune. I don't know about that one so much, just because it was available in mm-hmm. The Last Empire, but Ultux 72 concludes with, in the northern Scadrial area, the only known foreign language was the Terrace language at the time. So the idea that a Terraceman is then able to pick up another language in a region where there weren't that many linguistic differences, it's not like they were studying foreign languages because there aren't a lot of foreign languages on Scadrial. And finally, the Terrace person would have had to flee off planet, not working directly for Odium, kind of eliminating that as a resource. And in the final empire, especially in the early days, every Terrace man had a good reason to want to flee Scadrial if they could, which is, of course, their persecution. I think that there are some good points and some things that don't make any sense at all in that theory. I think that they're right. The sort of exodus of terrorist people would have had to have happened before era two. Mm -hmm. However, I think that most likely it would also be after era one. I think that we see um, Demu in particular. Of course. Demu and his wife at the end of era one, the terrorist woman. Um, We know that Demu is a world hopper. I think it stands to reason that his wife becomes a world hopper as well. So my thought is that those those people, those sort of like last of the line of terrorist people, Farukamis, those people and maybe like their direct descendants where the line of Farukami was still somewhat more pure than we sure. see it okay. in era two would be the Breaking. the world hoppers. Yeah. Yeah. And like I get it. That makes sense that they would be like, you know what? This planet's the world's not starting been great over. for us. Yeah, yeah. We're just going to peace out and like go try another planet. Yeah. That and just sense. the idea of there being more. Obviously, people are going to want to go out there and try it out. So that's my thought in terms of just the exodus in general. There's also a lot of different reasons why the terrorist people would want to get involved. Like this person is saying that the terrorist people of Scadrial were pacifist hippies extremely. And I don't think that's really accurate. They were um, non-interventionalists because they had yeah. to like protect their population. They were very persecuted and <laughs> yeah. part of the genocide. So it <laughs> yeah. makes sense that they weren't like, let's go get involved with everything. <laughs> yeah. But I don't necessarily think that makes them pacifist hippies. If anything, that is their reason to get involved with fights like the plight of the singers and the listeners, which we see and we'll talk more about in just a second. But that connection makes sense to me why terrorist people would specifically come to the listeners and say, like, we want to help you because we know what it's like to be having our population enslaved and persecuted and attempted to be wiped out. Well, especially if it is, as you speculated, a post-era one moment, because then you would have Zays as the prime example. And you could definitely imagine other terrorist people being inspired by that. The group that was protected by Hoyd, in fact, leading them to a safe place. But a group of them could have said, we've been inspired by Zazed work and are going to go out and kind of try to help in similar ways. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think yeah, could and, be the case here. And this person is saying like, oh, how would you recruit terrorist people from Scadrill without Harmony knowing? I mean, maybe you can't, but like, is that relevant? I don't think so. I mean, Harmony probably doesn't really care. Like he might know and just like, wh- I mean, whatever, you know? <laughs> I do think that that is a kind of good point in one regard, because the Farukamis are clearly very tied into Harmony. And if Harmony was going to know about anyone and their doings on Scadrial, it would seem he would know what the terrorist people were up to. Because I'm not of saying, no, I'm saying he does know. He does, exactly. It does, doesn't matter. There's tons of world hoppers. I agree that he doesn't have to have like a controlling stake yeah just because it's not mentioned doesn't mean he doesn't know i definitely think he would know yeah if it is terrorist people from scadrill that is like the only kind of fact if 
it is proven that Harmony doesn't know there are terrorist people on Rashar at some point in the future. We don't have that information right now. But if it was proven at some point in the future, I would go, okay, those terrorist people are probably not from Scadrill. That would be an indicator. And so that's really what I think this person is trying to point out. There's like, there's a couple of weird indicators here that maybe something could be astray, but we don't have enough information to really make a definitive statement. Yeah, I feel like really the only argument in favor of these being non scadrian Farukamis is that they do seem to be like pure, full Farukamis, Strong Farukamis, which yeah. doesn't really seem to exist as in the same like concentration in mm-hmm. era two. But also, I'm not totally clear on the timeline between it's like really Mistborn and Rashar. So also, it's like, well, what has been happening on Scadrial between now and then? And who knows? But that is only the crazy theory about a Farukamis because we have one that is far more solid. The much more obvious yes, one. Yes, go with the solid one. <laughs> As we just sort of alluded to is Axendweth, the terrace woman who comes to Venli. She is a part of Gavilar's retinue. I have a lot of questions about like, does Gavilar know that she's a Farukamist or a world hopper? Or is she like infiltrating his retinue? Is she there on her own business? Or is Gavilar like using her to help his own ends? Yeah, I mean, I cannot tell what would be a more likely thing. A terrorist person spy who is infiltrating or a terrorist person who is knowingly helping Gavilar as like a world hopper. And he like both of those seem kind of unlikely, but also possible. Either one is possible. My instinct says that she is in hiding, that he doesn't know that she's a world hopper and she's there to like do her own thing because of exactly what I was saying previously. She is part of the retinue as a quote unquote surgeon's assistant so she's probably getting some like medical knowledge from her metal minds. She speaks a leffy without an accent. She wears a bunch of rings and she shows a characteristic curiosity in like learning the culture of the listeners, which just perfectly pegs her <laughs> as a Farukamist. Then we have a full quote from her that kind of describes all of these goings on and her weirdness that is pointed out the woman spoke the words without a rhythm yes but they were perfectly understandable how venley said then hummed to betrayal oh i've always been good with languages the female said my name is axendwith though few here know me by that name i give it to you why because i think we're going to be friends venley she said i've been sent to search out someone like you someone who remembers what your people used to be Someone who wants to restore the glory that you've lost. End quote. And that's why I said all the things that I said. I think she is being driven by this connection to the listeners as another like persecuted people that now that her people are free from that situation, she is like compelled to come out and help others in the same position. She is a little bit sketchy. She for sure manipulates Venli and basically starts like all of the events on Rashar that we know of can this basically be traced thing. back to Axendwith. Yeah. yeah. Isn't this by far the most important this thing that it. we learn yeah. about why the events started? Yeah. And she gives Venli the gemstone that has the Voidspring Ulam inside. Like it's all Axendwith's fault. <laughs> And so I think that this puts her at the literal beginning, the impetus of the entire story. And it makes me question, again, like, what do we know about these people? Why Why is Harmony allowing this to happen? If they are terrorist people from Scadrill, why did he just I mean, start all the events on Rashar? Harmony wouldn't know what she was doing after she left Scadrill. Certainly wouldn't have so, the same type of sight yeah, or vision. Yeah, just because people leave, you're like, all right, cool, like, take your, go visit other planets, go on vacation, whatever. Once go they on get there. slash start a forever war. I know, but that's that what I'm going saying. To take Harmony doesn't cosmere. know that. I think that It just makes me wonder, like, is she working with an organization? 
it doesn't seem to be the ghost bloods, but is there some other like Cosmere wide organization that we don't know about that is, you know, mobilizing people in this way? Is she like part of a larger movement? Yeah, because it does seem like she has some knowledge about other Farukamis that are operating on Mershar, right? Yes. And that is important to note that it's pretty obvious that all of the Farukamis on Rashar do not have the same goals. And they might be purposefully sent to like break up the goals of someone else. That's why I believe that the theory that we posited from that user is important because it it definitely seems like different terrorist people, different Farukamis have different goals and different purposes. And the question is why when the Farukamis I mean, why that not? we know- They're people. But the Farukamis that we know all spawn from a very small, very contained but world. But Sazed is the perfect example of the fact that they are not a monolith. Each individual Farukamis has their own personality and desires. But even on Skadriel in Era 2, the Farukamis are like all living in their own isolated Only the community. ones that we see. I'm just that saying is- our vision is very... We have tunnel vision. We don't see a lot. And I think it's a mistake to like make a bunch of assumptions only based on what we've seen. Certainly. But it's also the fun and the whole point. (laughs) I'm just saying. I think that the question of why is clearly so many different Farukmas at the heart of what is going on on Rashar. Mm -hmm. That seems like something... It's a big question mark. Our boy Harmony would know about or be interested in, like, why are all of your brothers and sisters running around with descendants, whatever, uh, not descendants for him personally, because of that whole, you know, eunuch <sighs> situation. <laughs> oh, this might be cut. Do you think that God Harmony could, if he wanted to do like a Jesus situation and just impregnate oh. people? Or could he like inhabit a man that was not? Unifies. I think he probably could, but I don't feel like Zazed would. I agree that Zazed probably wouldn't, but do you think that the power of the Shard would have let you do something like that? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Cool. Cool. Okay, let's read this quote about the other Farukamis on Rashar. Quote, Axendweth says she's been discovered. She's very specific and rare kind of specialist. The details need not concern you, but there is apparently another of her kind in the palace, an agent for someone else. They found her and turned the human king against her. She's decided to pull out, end quote. Okay, so I guess that kind of answer is Gavilar definitely didn't know that she was a world hopper, and then she's outed. What was she doing? She's so cre- Should she have been outed? Was she trying to help? Is she a good guy? I mean, is no, she a bad she guy? started all the crap. Was that purposeful? Was it accidental? Was it based on something I like false knowledge it's... that she thought she was doing the right thing? Was she working for Odium? I wonder if it's kind of the same as what we see happening with the shards where there are, well, I don't know about the rest of the shards, but the conversation that the shards and Hoyd continually have, which is that Hoyd like wants to sort of guide the events of the Cosmere in certain ways. And many of the shards that we've seen believe in non-intervention and are just trying to, like, keep everything smooth, essentially, or, like, keep intervention out of the equation. I wonder if there's, like, a group of Farukmas who are like, no, we have a responsibility to, you be know, Be actively help. engaged. Yeah, to be activists, basically. Active measures, as they call it. And then the other Farukmas being like, you need to cut it out. Yeah. This is like a Farukamis war secretly yeah. going on in the, in the background of the regular war in the Stormlight Archive. Dang. I really think that this is a major, not misunderstanding, but a major unknown that is revealed to be key is that there are world hoppers that have made the events of the Stormlight Archive all possible. Mm-hmm. And I really want us to begin to recognize the Stormlight Archive as the meeting ground that it so clearly is. Like, this is where all the events are going. Everybody's coming to Rashar, flowing here from the other planets, getting directly involved, starting war, blah, blah, blah. And at least 
since we start the story in Way of Kings, like it's never been just about Rashar. Because again, it all comes back to Accent With. So now we're going to need a whole bunch of novellas just on Accent With. <laughs> We're just going to need to find out exactly what's going on. My brain is blown by this conversation. But we have more. There's more people everywhere. Yeah. This world hopping. <laughs> we, of course, have some world hoppers from Nalthus, mainly our boy Vasher. He's got some key scenes here and scenes where he is much more open about himself and like his history than we've really ever seen him in the past which is really cool yeah do you think he's sitting at the end of the world and just being like well no point lying anymore yeah i well i think it's sort of a function of his age like i really do think he's just lived for so long we all know that old people get to the end of their lives and like they just don't care anymore (laughs) well and he talked about this specifically is that the heralds vasher the returned and kelsier thydekar are versions of the same thing and Kelsier is the youngest of them. Vasher is in the middle and the heralds are the oldest. Vasher is going to become what the heralds are in his way. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but it's not a happy future that old magically returned individuals have to look forward to. Like you get a couple of nice years living in the God King's palace and hanging out with cool bros like Light Song, <laughs> eating grapes and whatnot. But long term, bad, 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 bad. And so I think Vasher has to be starting to recognize that his scene of like clutching on to the little rock that seems yeah, like, the fossil. Yeah, kind of have memories and surrounding well, it's that a, idea. It's a depiction of he thinks it's like a depiction of himself. Yes, that he is the fossil. Yeah. And we've talked about how you can't trust anyone's single perspective. It's just his version of reality. But Vasher definitely is way more open about his past, his history, and what he sees is going on in the Cosmere in Rhythm of War. And wow, are those great scenes. I know they are some of your favorite. Let's read part of the conversation that Vasher has with Kaladin. Would you like to be Vasher or Kaladin? I'll let you be Cal. Okay. Quote, I know why most of them left the battlefields of hell, but not you. Why did you join the Ardens? Because I learned the conflict would find men no matter how hard I tried. I no longer wanted a part in trying to stop them. But you couldn't give up the sword, Kaladin said. Oh, I gave it up. I let go. Best mistake I ever made. End quote. Clearly, Kaladin is talking about like the the metaphorical sword. The sword in our hearts. Yeah, setting down the sword and stop fighting. And you don't even know, kid. Vasher is specifically talking about Nightblood. Holding on to that thing also has to age you. Like, you know how you see presidents at the beginning of their term? It's like having a toddler, but for like hundreds of years. Like the toddler never grows up. And you're just constantly like babysitting this (laughs) tiny child. They can also destroy everything. I mean, if you ask a parent of toddlers, they will probably say that toddlers are... That is a (laughs) nightblood. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Dress up your terrible twos as a dark black sword with smoke coming out of their heads. That would be hilarious. Continuing their conversation, we have, quote, What are you? Kaladin asked. Are you like wit? There had always been something about Zahel, something too knowing, something distinct, set apart, different from the others. No, Zahel said. I don't think there's anyone quite like Hoyd. I knew him by the name Dust when I was younger. I think he must have a thousand different names among a thousand different peoples. And you? Kaladin settled down on the stone beside Zahel. How many names do you have? A few, Zahel said. More than I normally share. End quote. There is also, of course, the conversation that Kaladin and Vasher have while they are fighting as well. But about type two invested entities and the different investiture types that we have discussed previously. You're welcome to go back in our back catalog and check out those. I think that the Vasher and Nightblood story 
is clearly one of the linking pieces you know the puzzle is being built on both sides i'm interested and there's to a big see thing in the middle that like we need. where it's gonna go it doesn't you seem know? like anything that i can predict it seems so mysterious in a lot of ways because they're both there but they don't necessarily seem to have like their own momentum or their own storyline that's happening outside of the main storyline Compared so, to someone like Azure, who's very character motivated, like she has her own internal purpose right, and she's yes. going forward. And Vasher is just kind of chilling. Yeah. And Nightblood is kind of being dragged along, obviously, yeah. as a sword, doing whatever he does, including eating odium. But there is a big question of like, why, how? It's interesting for a character to lack that type of narrative momentum, but it also may make sense when we Ooh, take in the maybe age. okay maybe this is like basher's purpose as a return and he's gonna give up his returned breath to save someone Ooh, maybe that's the final battle dalinar is gonna like get killed by odium but then vasher is like gonna bring him back that would be amazing i think that's gotta be it i think vasher like knew what his you know what his returned purpose was came to rishar and he's just been waiting to fulfill his purpose he's like put himself in the right position to be in the right place at the right time and he's just chilling because he's just waiting for that moment when he's going to give up his breath that is the purpose of a return yeah and vasher did seemingly have like some problems with his lack of fulfilling his purpose i think that that's an excellent question of is Vasher in the place that he thinks he needs to be to accomplish the only thing that Returned are supposed to do? And what a nightmare of a life if you had seen this glimpse of something you had to do, but it was long in the future on a different planet from your own. Oh my gosh. And the sacrifices and all the pain and stuff that he was going to have to go through to get to that thing. But he knew that he had to get there, maybe even not like completely cognizantly yeah exactly yeah. but just like he knows it i'm not done i haven't done whatever i need to do i can feel it so i'm just going to keep on going forward oh bummer life so sorry for our boy vasher let's do a couple of quick jumps around the cosmere that happen to be on rashar because we see a couple of uses of investiture for the first time from Taldane, we have the use of white sand, where Clearly, Boniel and yep. Vani use that. We've got the white sand. I have so many questions about like where it came from. How did the fused get it? How did they learn about this method the of properties measuring of it? Yeah. investiture? It is genius in terms of its measurement of investiture and then the importance of that. It's like a, you know, a, a perfectly balanced scale was hard to come by in a rough and tumble world that we used to live in when you couldn't like have things that were kept, you know, to a fine, perfect degree. And when you're dealing with maybe like precious metals, like really, really fine measurements are important because it can be the difference between, you know, money. And so I love this idea that it's basically operating like an investiture scale, balancing out how much investiture is inside of something that you put close to it. It's just like so simple, so genius. And now we have an economy because we can measure our gold or we can measure our silver or we can measure our stormlight. Yeah, the ability to measure the stormlight is certainly going to be interesting. And like what changes is that going to make to the way that things are done now? And the hints that we got that the Thalen people and perhaps some other people were storing away all of the good gemstones Mm -hmm. and like controlling the flow of gemstones in like a back room type of way when they were getting all the things that they want while also getting rich just the way that the bankers do but i think that there's a lot of questions that it also brings up about the relationship between race odium and autonomy yeah that's what i was just thinking it certainly is makes for a good argument that odium and autonomy are in cahoots somehow because it would appear that Ribaniel has been using this method for a while in her recycles and rebirths and whatnot. So definitely now our boy Terra Vodium has access to all of that knowledge. Whatever race of Odium was doing, I assume that Terra Vodium's all tapped into that knowledge-wise. It'd be interesting to see if he makes any different choices in terms of like any type of 
alliance with autonomy. I feel like Teravangian is the kind of person who would be like, no, I don't need you. We're not in an alliance anymore. And he would just like go on his own way. It is interesting because Hoyd seemingly was unable to spot the difference between Risa Odium and Teravodium. Seemingly. I wonder if that holds true for shards that aren't really paying attention. Like maybe yeah. a good shard can pick it out quickly. But if you are trying to ignore everything, and you that's kind of your intent. You would think it would be intent, like obvious. I would think that to Hoyt as well and clearly but could have been But we have a mistaken. lot of questions about that scene. We also see Sion's. Apparently the ghost bloods have them and Wit has one and they are being used in the As background the to devices. communicate. Yeah. So interesting. I'm thinking they, like the people on Rashar may have gotten them from the Irie who are hanging out in the cognitive realm. Oh, I definitely think it was Thytokar Kelsier getting them from the Irie and then sending them over to, to his people bloods. on Rashar. Mm, and yeah, he that's is a good the call. supplier. Yeah. Or not even the supplier necessarily because the Seans come from Cell. So I think that he is the trade master of the Cosmere. Yeah. And he's moving that stuff around. And what a powerful device, especially because it doesn't just work on planet, which... The Rasharians have kind of figured out, but is a difficult thing on every other planet. The Rasharians have the span reads, which kind yeah. of allow instant communication. But across the Cosmere, to have instant communication is insanely valuable. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. But you could clearly also imagine if we're dealing with large-scale military conflicts, wars across the entire continent, how important and powerful of a mechanism it would be to coordinate instantaneously across those large distances it was important in earth's history i we have seen how span reads are used occasionally in rasharian history this device just doing the same thing but now across the cosmere it's like the world wide web has turned on and you have connected rashar to all the other nodes throughout the Cosmere. Well, just the ability to be able to communicate between the cognitive realm and the physical realm. Hugely beneficial. Yeah. yeah. Could you find a hack? Do you think that you could find a hack to use Spren to communicate like a span read, but without their imprisonment on the physical side? Mm. Could you be bartering Good question. for the Spren to get like some stormlight if you go past this message? Oh. Or something like that. You are talking about just having them be like carrier pigeons. Well, I don't know. Okay, so how it works now is like I a split like... atom type of thing where it's like right. they're quantumly the entangled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so could you do that, but with the Spren's cooperation? I feel like it would have to be some type of Fabriel in like a OG soul caster way mm. where the spren is manifesting in the physical realm as a is soul caster that you would have to get a spren to manifest as some type of communication device. For sure, for sure. I like that. Clearly, Marais has a huge part to play in Rhythm of War. He not only is operating as an antagonist and motivation for Shallan and her arc, he's also stuck in Urethiru for most of the book and is using that position to make some deals and trades that we only can speculate on how important are going to be down the road. Yeah, there's that gift he gives to Raboniel, and I don't think we have any confirmation as to what that gift actually is. I think there's some type of comment where it like clinks like metal or something. And so there's a theory that it might be that special chain that can anchor you through a pul perpendicularity. But I, I think there's a lot of things it could be. The only speculation that I've heard is the chain. And that definitely is another one of these mechanisms that is very, very valuable. But and then I'm also like, okay, he gives it to Raboniel, and then we don't see it again. And so it's just like lurking out there waiting to come back into the storyline. And I'm just like, keep thinking about when is it going to come back? What is it going to mean? What part is it going to play? And we would say that Raboniel, because of the way that she died is dead, dead. For sure. Yeah. But if there was a device 
that allowed for someone to return from Bray's, if you died on Rashar, could you take that with you when you went and then like return no. by your own choice? No, I think that's the point of being dead dead. She can't do anything. She's actually dead. I agree for Rabaniel, but I'm saying if someone else, could, is that like a loophole that you can escape through the perpendicularity of your own choosing or something like that? Mm, there's, I don't think so. There's some mechanism and... This is going to segue into another theory, but there is some mechanism of the movement between Rashar and Braze and possibly Ashen that we don't quite understand yet, that yeah. that may be a mechanism that can be abused. Well, we know it was abused. To start this desolation, it was abused. And so Tall never broke. Tall never broke. Do you want to talk more about that? Oh, I mean, this is just new information that was released recently because Brandon was asked a question and someone asked about Tall specifically breaking and Brandon was like, I just want to correct that Tall didn't break. And that was all. No more details about that. That's big news. It definitely introduces what I just said, that something weird happened to start this desolation. Yeah. And so... Maybe devices like this chain are a way of doing something weird. And maybe that's how Moray's got it. You know, he was part of the desolation beginning in some way. I don't think those two things are connected, but I think they're both individually interesting. There you go. I like it. Okay, cool. What I think can be said without a doubt is that all of these crossovers, all of these world hoppers, all of the continued expansion of the Cosmere universe points us in the direction that we are going and allows for the craziest of possible speculations. You can go as deep as you want to. There's going to be an Avengers style crossover <laughs> where Kaladin flies down and is oh standing next to a, a gun toting wax <laughs> and Wayne is jumping in and out of time. And then you have people from cell who are writing aeons in the air. And like, you can do the full, like and on James your left style. type of thing. Yes, exactly. And then just Cosmere nerds assemble <laughs> will be the calling cry. I believe you mean chicken scouts assemble. Chicken scouts assemble. That's <laughs> genius. But I think that there is a couple of the Brandon Sanderson specials that are probably holding us back from that type of reality. And one of them was mentioned by a Reddit user, Kaiser, K-I-Y-S-E-R. Kaiser mentioned, was talking about Marais and was discussing Marais's point about how invested objects are uniquely tied to their place. But it does seem to be kind of a Rasharian limitation. I mean, no, because of Thytokar. Marais's whole interest is because Thytokar is interested and he is on schedule. Yes, there are. And the first time we're really introduced to this concept is in Mistborn Secret History when Kelsier is like trying to take objects throughout the cognitive realm and he discovers that it's difficult to take them like far away from where they are anchored and himself when he is trying right. to go to the west across yeah. the ocean to eventually the eyrie he feels like a gravity tugging him back yeah to so here's kaiser's theory and i just want to explain it as they presented it okay quote Marais makes it sound like moving invested people and objects is kind of a uniquely Risharian or Stormlight problem. My current thinking is it has to do with whatever Honor did to keep Odium bound to Berets in the Risharian system. Marais mentions that the more invested a person or object is, the heavier it becomes, resisting moving too far away from Rashar, and as the shard Odium or any shard is obviously heavily invested, that would explain their imprisonment. Maybe that is how Odium's prison actually works. If this is true, then cultivation and all the other radiance and everything are also trapped on Rashar. End quote. Now, we believe that the radiance and other powerful entities are trapped on Rashar, but that is currently speculation we haven't necessarily tested that but we haven't seen any world hoppers yeah i mean i think like quote unquote trapped is a really strong word i think that it is a universal cosmere thing that 
as this person is saying, invested people and objects are more difficult to move around, period. <laughs> like, I don't think that that's necessarily trapped, period, like cannot move at all. I think it's more like a Kelsier situation where he can move throughout the cognitive realm, but it's difficult. And there probably is like an end range where he can no longer move. I do think it's interesting this thought about Odium because if Tanavast or a Bondsmith maybe did something to force Odium to become one of the quote unquote true rhythms of Rashar Mm -hmm. and like really become a part, an integral part of that system, then that could create that type of capital C connection or bond or like investment into the world that would then really would disable him from moving away from the system. Okay, so let's go to what Moraes actually says, and he's saying this to Shalon. Could you read this for us? Yeah. Quote, The same limitation restrains people who are themselves heavily invested. Radiance, Spren, anyone connected to Rashar is bound by these laws and cannot travel farther than Ashen or Braze. You are imprisoned here, Radiant. End quote. So his key thing says that anyone who is capital C connected to Rashar is bound by these laws and cannot travel outside the system. Caveat, how much do we trust what Moraes says? Or how much does Moraes know <laughs> just in general? Like, you know, he might not have any inkling of what is actually possible. Yeah. I mean, just it's what certainly he in Moraes' interest to make other people think they're dependent on him for like off-world things, you know? That's a great point. So... I'm not saying that that's necessarily the only reason he might totally be telling the truth, but I just want to introduce the caveat. Here is now where my speculation takes over. We've laid out the user's interesting point, and they've pointed out an interesting thing. Maybe Odium is bound by this same principle that binds everyone else to Rashar. As you said, maybe it's because of something like tying him to Rashar, making him one of those true I feel like that really makes sense because that's also like what breaks the sibling Mm -hmm. the sibling is no longer able to like you know hear the rhythms because it's not listening for Odium's Odium's rhythm too and it just seems like that would make sense if Tanavast suddenly was like you know what we can't beat him the only thing we can do is trap him make some part of Rashar everything breaks because of it and now here we are and that is My theory, I'm going to take it one step further and say that Honor's truest surge is actually what is the mechanism that allows for the imprisonment of Odium. Honor's truest surge, adhesion, (laughs) could have, what Honor could have figured out, exactly what you just said. He had that entire conversation Mm -hmm. with himself, and then he figured out the mechanism to make that reality is to change a bit of connection for Odium so that he is now connected to Rashar and thus binding him there. Maybe that impacts everyone and it's like yeah. Risharian wide now. He couldn't yeah, I mean, you've only basically focus it on a single individual. Changed like the laws of your planet. Exactly like what happened on Cell. Cell yeah, yeah, exactly. had the geography and the world tied into its magic system. Yeah because of all the chaos that happened there. And this is what I think that Honor was able to figure out as well, using adhesion to somehow interweave the spiritual connection to a physical connection. He basically joined what is normally spiritual, capital Mm -hmm. C connection, and he put it in the physical realm, which is Rashar. This is my theory. Wait, you think that Odium is invested into Rashar the planet? Of course. He's one of the true like the way that their like Pat G is invested? No. I mean, I think like the way that we have talked about him being a true rhythm. Just that there's like a connection. Not that he's actually like invested into the core of the planet or something. Oh no. I don't think that he's actually in the center of the planet. Okay, okay, okay. But I think like on Scantrial, how the gods manifest god metals because they are interwoven into the planet. They, the planet is them. Well, they created no, the planet. They're not the planet. 
the metal is the physical manifestation of their power. Because so you're just they saying are... that there is some type of physical manifestation of odium on Rishar because he is now one of the true surge or true rhythms of Rishar. Exactly. But I don't think that he used to be. I think that honor made it so. Mm -hmm. And I think he did that through adhesion in the same way that eventually the Oath Pact is going to be formed. And in the same way that adhesion works generally as a surge for our Windrunners. Do we know that the Oath Pact is formed by adhesion? I always thought it was just capital C connection. It is Dalinar's ability as a bondsmith. Mm -hmm. It is his adhesion ability that allows him to form bonds between people. The thing that Ashar does when he binds all of the Windrunners to the ground, mm -hmm. that is what is I think Oh yeah, it's honor... like spiritual adhesion exactly. or something. That okay. is what Honor did to Odium. He grabbed Odium as a shard and then bound him to the planet just speculated. like a shard yeah speculated. of course of course speculating i'm sorry i don't mean to say this is definitely yeah, yeah. what happened you're making strong statements i don't want anyone to be confused i am only trying to present <laughs> it in the clearest way possible that i think that those are all interrelated powers and if you take it up to the scale everyone's talking you know this last book about honors true surge okay well if that's the thing that he's best at mm -hmm. then he would do the best version of what we've seen the lesser versions of him do. And Ashar does something like that, and Dalinar can do something like that. I That's like the that logic. theory. I really can't talk any more about this honors true surge business. I'm like so over it. <laughs> because it at this point can still be nothing. It cannot be any different. It can just be like some kind of yeah, talk at this point. I just think we like don't have basically any information, and there are just so many wild theories. I, I can't talk about it until we get more concrete info. Let's go to a word of Brandon to conclude this all, to wrap okay. it all up, put Let's it in a little it. bow. Because Brandon had this to say when asked about moving investiture around the Cosmere. Quote, investiture from different system acts in different ways. Certain people have managed, for example, to get some kinds of investiture to leave their home world through the use of a kind of magical pipeline. Mm. Breaths attach to the identity of the individual and are fully given away freely, which removes some of this connection. It's a nature of endowment that the gift is given without strings attached, so to speak. But while it's a renewable resource, it's a difficult one. Rashar is extra sticky, so to speak, with investiture. It's part of the nature of honor, cultivation, and oaths. So getting it off is a problem, though collecting it is not. And that, I believe, is the Brandon hint that sticky is how we describe the silly power of the surge. Adhesion is shown to like the very first time you stick something yes, to the wall. But I'm going to point out that he says that this stickiness is part of the nature of honor, comma, cultivation, comma, and oaths, not just honor. It has something to do with them together. I agree, because... We have already talked about what Navani and Rabaniel realize is that it is the merging of all of these different tones and rhythms that makes Rashar function as a whole. So I definitely do think that it is not as honor focused as the honor spren make it out to be. Obviously, they're the ones who are like, it's definitely honored true with Surge. That dude was awesome. I think that it is a collective solution to a problem and honor is just using the mechanism that exists for him that he has used in other ways of the bonds that bind us i think it's a really good possible theory for how odium is trapped he just can't undo something as powerful as one of those innate surges and like whatever was done to him he can't just break it there's nothing that can just be easily done by force. He has all the force in the world. He's the most powerful thing in the cosmos. But we also know that just by the word of Dalinar, he could be freed. All Dalinar would have to say would be like, okay, go away. So it has to be by that logic that you just laid out. It has to be of honor's doing. Yeah, I think we already knew that because Odium is like, oh, is the yeah. person you know carrying Tenevast power offering me a way out? 
yeah, clearly it's honor, but we don't know that it's adhesion. It seems like we've we've also speculated that it just has something to do with a deal that was made between them and, you know, Odium can't break out because of the terms of the deal. That's a good speculation as well. I just want to take that logic that you just laid out and say that cultivation doesn't appear to be the thing that is in the way right now. It seems to be something that Honor did either with adhesion or with a deal or with something. Right now, it appears that Honor is like the key that Odium thinks is the key to getting off world. Yeah. And that could all, of course, be flipped on its head when cultivation was like, I grew a garden around you and now you are trapped there by my thorns and whatnot. But I mean, or like, you know, the edge dancers are probably not even affected by adhesion because they're just like, I'm slippery. Ooh, super slippies. Ooh. I love that. That they're just like, they can slip right out of adhesion. Yeah. So like the cultivation people mm, are yeah. slippy and the honor people are sticky. It's so silly when you present it in that way. <laughs> but I think that's really important. Like, I think that's an idea that we should take to heart. The ones who are closest so to really... cultivation are super slippy. Yeah. And the ones who are closest to honor are really sticky. So maybe the edge dancers are the key to getting off of Roshar because if there's spiritual adhesion, maybe there's also spiritual Spir- friction. Yeah. <laughs> spiritual slippiness. That's what it is. Just slip right through. Slip on through to the other side. We're going to keep this train rolling. Every other week, you can <laughs> come to this great resource, Cosmic Knowledge. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Please remember to rate and review us. Share us with your friends. Share us with your enemies. Share, share, share. It's great. Brooke, can you take us away? Until next time, life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. <laughs> <laughs>